I, one time I had this big picture of getting rich and, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I threw that out the window uh, because I realized that that, that wouldn't be what made me happy anyway. Welcome to the Dispensary Marketing Podcast, where we interview the top dispensary owners and experts in this space so that you can stay up to date with the latest trends and strategies that you'd otherwise miss out on. I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Dispensary Marketing Podcast, Hunter. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So you own one location in Edmond, Oklahoma. Tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the dispensary. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a uh... I'm a married dad of two kids, a couple businesses. I, I also have a brewery on the side with my brothers over in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I've been uh, in cannabis in Oklahoma since 2019. Uh, we started uh, with a cultivation facility and weren't really planning on getting into retail. But as things got saturated, we went ahead and joined up and opened the retail shop and uh, now we're here just chugging along. I'm uh, originally from Colorado and I was there till 2019. So I was pretty well experienced in the, in the cannabis game. I was a medical patient in 2005. And uh, when Colorado went on board with their dispensaries and cultivations like in 07, 08, 09, uh, I was kind of involved in that. Um, and yeah, here I am. So this brewery, you know, I know you just slid that in just now. Were you, was this, this is before you started all this? Uh, so the brewery opened about almost six years ago now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was something that I had ventured into prior to this. Uh, my brothers and I always enjoyed uh, craft beer and home brewing. And one of my brothers was in Australia and uh, with an oil and, when his company pulled out of Australia, he uh, he had actually met a lady, and they were they were planning on their first child. So he decided to stay there as his company left and become an entrepreneur. And uh, in that, through some major struggles with uh, mm -hmm. some partners uh, and whatnot, he he had some room for investors, and my little brother and I hopped on board with him. There you go. The uh, you know, no matter what industry, it seems as though if you choose the title of entrepreneur, there's always going to be something that goes wrong. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you said you started in cultivation, so you didn't. You obviously didn't start straight to retail. So you know, how did you transition from, I guess, the brewery to now cultivation in Oklahoma? Okay, so when I was in Colorado, I was cultivating uh, as well as working with an extraction lab there. Mm -hmm. And so I had plenty of experience. Um, and the dream that they kind of sold in Oklahoma was cheap licensing. Uh, it's easy to get in. It, pretty much anybody can do it. And, and uh, I went ahead and, and flew out here and checked out the market on, on a recommendation from a partner in Colorado who had also started up out here. And mm -hmm. uh, two weeks later, I moved here. So it, it happened really fast because I've got kids and school started that August. So right. I made the decision and jumped on board. I actually moved here before I even had my licenses approved. Mm -hmm. So I've had a few interviews of, you know, and again, few entrepreneurs in this space where they are ones to make really quick decisions or they're the ones to make the, uh, I'm going to wait, sit on it for six months, sit on it for 12 months and really decide if I really want to do that, right? Um, it seems you're the former. <laughs> you're one that does a lot of stuff very quickly. Were you always like like this? Uh, yeah, I've I've always been a bit like that. Just kind of jump, jump in full on. Uh, although I've learned quite a few lessons, and and uh, over the past few years, I I would mm. say that on new ventures, I'm a little bit more slow. <laughs> mm, mm, mm -hmm. What would you say are some of the learnings? I guess from you know going from venture to venture. Uh, really, a lot of it is. Do your market research. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say uh, that's something that I probably lacked a little bit of on the Oklahoma move. Sure. Um, I, I was really expecting it to go recreational soon uh, mm -hmm. as I felt like the whole country was moving towards that. All right. And uh, it's, it stayed medical. And they had recreational on the ballot last year, and, and it failed miserably. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and and in hindsight, I should have seen that coming. Um, so so we're restricted here to uh, it's roughly three hundred fifty thousand patients. Right. And uh, it's probably one of the, the most saturated markets in the country for sure. So right. it's uh you have to be strategic and uh and real professional to keep customers here cuz it's very convenient for them to go elsewhere. Right. So what what would be some of the things that you would have looked for knowing what you know now um when you first got started? I think you know, like I said, market research, that would have been one of the biggest ones. I mm-hmm. would have uh, researched the demographics here a little bit more sure. and the thought a little bit harder about what their support for recreational cannabis would have been, mm-hmm. um, as well as, honestly, when, when, I, when I came to Oklahoma, it was, I, I just saw it as nothing but opportunity. And mm. I didn't at that time, especially there was little regulation and I really just was thinking on those facts. Um, and, and the reality was there was a whole lot more rec, uh, a whole lot more regulation to come mm. after that. And, uh, and now it's, it's, it's the most overregulated industry in the country for sure. Yeah. 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 And overtaxed. And, and I understand it because things definitely got out of hand in Oklahoma. Uh, a lot of people moved here from all over the world. Right. And, uh, and we're kind of hiding behind licenses and thriving on the black market uh, because right. there wasn't much regulation. But uh, now there is. And, uh, and they're doing a good job of, of uh, unfortunately, tearing businesses down. But uh, but it's something that needed to happen in order to uh, to basically save the industry here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, would you say that regulation is both the the one of the biggest obstacles, but one of the necessary evils kind of going on right now? Absolutely, uh, yeah. I would say that as well as just market saturation. Sure, uh, the, the dispensary side is still very saturated and a lot of people are holding on um and the growth side is starting to free up a bit uh Mm -hmm. the cultivation side our sales have seen a spike over the last couple months nice uh you know in october of 23 they cut off well over half of the cultivation licenses due Mm -hmm. to uh, building codes and things like that because oklahoma is predominantly rural Mm-hmm. And in those rural areas, there is no building code. And right. So the state fire marshal came on board and said, look, every cannabis facility in the state is going to now have to pass uh, international building code, right. fire code. And that that ended up causing a lot of problems for a lot of operators. Right. But not you. Not, nope, not me. I'm <laughs> still on board. I, I made it through <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, like, so essentially, the saturation on the retail side um, is one of the biggest hurdles that you're trying to face because just of competition. And then, due to some of the regulations also put in place, it allowed you to kind of free up some of the competition on the cultivation side. It's kind of like a double edged sword. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty much how it worked. On the dispensary yeah. side, it has caused some uh, some hurdles because we had a lot of products that we carried and those operators those vendors actually shut down a few MSOs right uh, are leaving town um, sure. so there's there's some hurdles there with uh, product yeah. yeah yeah so on the marketing side I'm curious so I mostly speak uh, with regards to the retail but I'm curious like if you'd be able to touch on both the I guess the customer acquisition side on both the cultivation and on the retail side, like how does that look? So um, on the, on the retail side, the marketing of it is really just trying to be as convenient as you can to Mm. all the patients, uh, trying to reach them and let them know that you're here through uh, social media, through, uh, events you know there's there was a lot of cannabis events here and Mm -hmm. and the regulation has kind of stomped that out a little bit 
Uh, but it was a good way to get your name out there, bring products, show them that you're professional and clean, and and you uh, you test your products, and, right. and you're not just selling selling what you can make a dime off of. So, uh, on the cultivation side, it's really just feet on ground mm-hmm. and uh, hitting those dispensaries, trying to develop good relationships with the dispensary owners. And, uh, and actually owning a dispensary has kind of helped me there because, um, because I, I understand that side of it too. Right. And I understand where they're, you know, they have to have enough margins to stay open at least, you know, and, and, and in Oklahoma, it's definitely gotten that competitive yeah. where margins are being cut to just open cost, you know? Right. And there's not that much profit in in uh, the retail game um, for some. Right, right, right. And then you also mentioned that you know just due to just it being non recreational and due to the saturation and stuff like that, it's it's really easy for customers to just kind of like hop to one dispensary if they really want to. Um, so, what's your general strategy to kind of keep people, I guess, locked in into your own ecosystem? Uh, with our customer retention, uh, w- we actually have pretty good retention rates. And mm. I, I would say that that has to do with uh, a lot of the number one quality product uh, always. And I've had this saying since I joined the cannabis industry in 2005, that quality always sells and, yeah. uh, and people will come for quality. So I feel like that's one of the main things as well as uh, the dispensary feel, uh, uh, I go into hundreds of dispensaries in Oklahoma while I'm making cultivation right. sales. Right. And uh, in those visits, I would say a solid 70% of dispensaries are in such a struggle mode that it's really hard for them to keep a real professional look and feel sure. to the dispensary. It's hard for them to keep stock. Mm. Um, unless if they're working on net terms, but um, I I think overall it's really just quality and dispensary feel, and that comes down to how our bud tenders are communicating with the patients, uh, what our products are, what our prices are. We have to keep yeah. everything relevant to the market. So, right. Right, right. So I hear this a lot from a lot of people saying that like quality product is is the the largest or one of the largest, if not the largest driver of people coming back into the store. If you don't have good product, don't have good product, right? So how do you determine good product, um, both in new products that you bring in and then both in products that stay on the shelf? I would assume that the products that you would say that stay on the shelf are the ones that, you know, sell very well the ones that you get good customer feedback from hey this was an awesome product that you brought in but when you're looking at the rotation of products you know a lot of people want the new new products coming in and stuff like that what is your process to determine what like how do you quantify what a good quality product is it's somewhat of a mixture of things i think you know branding is is key in oklahoma there's there's almost two markets here uh the branded market and the commodities market okay and uh there's there's a real wholesale avenue uh of flour because there's heaps of it accessible and then there's the branded flour Mm -hmm. and you know both of them so you want you want to find an affordable good quality product for your patients but you also want to get them what they want. So mm-hmm. we have we have customers on both ends. We have customers that want um, a branded, high quality product. Typically, if they are branded, they they have SOPs in place to continue producing consistent quality. Mm-hmm. Um, as well as you know, people that want more affordable stuff. Then we we have relationships with vendors to where you know we number one have visited their facilities we've seen that they're clean and professional uh that they if it's a cultivation that they grow in a good manner and right. not using pesticides and whatnot there's also testing 
everything is supposed to be tested, but the testing market in Oklahoma has gone through quite a few regulatory changes as well, and they were testing in different manners. Mm -hmm. So uh, some were testing with different machines, and and it gives you different results. And uh, I'm sure you've probably heard of the 50% THC flowers yeah. in Oklahoma, <laughs> uh, those are starting to disappear as right. as regulation catches up with these labs and makes them start to operate on a uh, more level playing field. So they're sure. all running the same equipment, have the same um, uh, what would you call them testing levels that they yeah. they uh, they set their machines to. So yeah. Uh, that and then I personally test them. We have our our uh, our patients test samples as well. We have our bud tenders test samples, and that'll kind of give you the personal feel of sure. what the product does for an individual. It's it's different for everybody, and everyone's looking for a different feel or a different uh, type of relief in the medical market. And right. I would say that you know it's kind of a mixture of all of those things is is the key to keeping customers coming back um, right but, but as long as they feel good and you get them something that they're looking for, then they're probably going to come back right so, right and we right. also we do things like loyalty programs we have punch cards where uh, we have a great loyalty program that we we don't make any money on it for sure, but it's it's giving back to the community, and, and I'm a firm believer in that here because Oklahoma especially is, um, I would say it's more of a small town community support than mm-hmm. buying what's neat and branded. Like we have a lot of locals that really sure. support us just because we're we're here in this area. Our kids go to school here. Our businesses are here, and, and we know a lot of people here. So we get a lot of, of support in the community. So, right. So the the measurements. So essentially, what you do is you take your preliminary measurements, and then you see what the cultivators are using, what tools they are using, and then as you mentioned, different tools provide different results just because of the different baselines that they might be using and the different. Um, uh, essentially correlation of whatever it is that they want to correlate to, right? And then you then figure out your own specific quantitative values from your own testing. And then you're like, okay, based on X, you know, ranges of what we look for in a product, then you bring those to market or to your specific market um, because you at least have a good baseline idea of what works and then from there you then would take the customer feedback to be like okay well this lines up with our testing this lines up with what they want and then you're off to the races that's is that like in a nutshell kind of how that works i would say so yeah and i would say another thing too is that we're constantly asking our patients if there's something that we don't have that they want and if sure. there's okay. something that we don't have that they want we do our best to get it in our store uh, give it to them, but also test it on other patients, test it ourselves and see if it's something that we want to keep for the long haul or if it's something that we're going to have to tell that patient, you know, maybe this this other product is comparable and you should sure. go with that for these reasons. You know? Sure, sure. So at least in the recreational market, people are, you know, the generalization is highest THC, lowest cost. Um, is that the same in the medical space or is it slightly more nuanced than like, I just want this 50 THC flower, which is pretty crazy, but. <laughs> um, you know, we, I would say for for a while, especially for probably the first six months to year sure. that we were open. So we've been open since uh, February, March of 2022. Uh, Mm-hmm. And I would say the first six months to year, we saw a whole lot more people coming in and they really just wanted to know what the numbers were on the sure. test. Yeah. Uh, as, as we started to connect with our patients and develop relationships, we, we were able to kind of convince them to try others. Uh, not everything is based on those numbers and the testing right. is somewhat or was somewhat flawed at that time right and we would tell our patients that you know so um 
I would say I would say that the the testing numbers matter, but our patients in particular have been a bit more flexible and sure. they'll 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 really take recommendations and they'll they'll buy what works for them. So Right, right, right. I would say our dispensary is in an area where we have um, a little bit higher income demographic okay. and yeah. we have a little bit older demographic. Mm. So mm. Uh, those patients are there. This is all pretty new stuff to them yeah. uh, because it's been, you know, 30 years since they consumed yeah. uh, legally anyway and had a product selection so wide. Yeah. that they had choices. And so yeah. a lot of them are looking for recommendations. Sure, sure. That makes sense. I mean, that's a really good point. I mean, back in the day, it was like, you get what you can get from whoever, right? It was like, hey, I have, yeah, and whatever made up strain name, chocolate chip cookie, OG Kush. And you're like, sure, right? Like, you know, I'll I'll, I'll take that one. So that's super interesting. Um, uh, another uh, person I was speaking to, they, they made the good analogy is like when you're drinking wine, you, you don't just go into the wine store and be like, I want the highest alcohol wine out there. You want, yeah. you know, do you want red? Do you want white? Do you want rosé? Do you want a spark? Like whatever it is, right? So I was like, that makes sense. Um, but you know, very much so. Um, you see it with just the level of compliance and regulation. This industry is still like in its infancy, right? Despite, you know, it being consumed for such a long period of time. And you brought up a good point about that, that the branded versus like kind of affordable, like what's, you know, the differences between the two. And it doesn't seem to me, at least like there is the, you know, the Gucci of cannabis flower, right? Like maybe it might be priced like that. Like this is priced as premium flower, but you know, it, it's not necessarily recognized in the market yet as such. So it, it, it makes sense that, you know, the, the branded quality versus affordable quality, there might not be the massive difference right now, or at least until kind of the market matures and everyone's like, okay, this is by far the best way to make product. And this is the reason why it's more expensive because it makes me feel this way, right? So that, that makes like a lot of sense in terms of everything that's going on there. Um, so, uh, you know, we spoke about a lot of loyalty and the quality product, but I, I think one of the more important things is, you know, once the customer comes into the store, the person that they interact with largely determines their experience shopping with you. So quality product is the thing that determines how they feel once they are like consuming whatever product is once they go home. But if I have a bad interaction with John and, you know, John is like, hey, uh, what are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. Or like, you don't belong here or it just doesn't give customer service. You're essentially losing that customer, you know, forever. Right. Mm -hmm. So on the in-store strategies, like what does that look like? One to kind of obviously you want to drive sales, but you don't want to be too salesy. And then you also want to provide good recommendations, but not, you know, encroach on any of the compliance things saying that you need, like, there's a fine balance, I think, uh, for all of these, these different aspects. So how do you kind of tackle that? You're, you're right, there is a fine balance there. I would say, you know, our, our team of bud tenders, they're, they are our business. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would say that a lot of that comes down to you know our our process of selecting them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we prefer experienced bud tenders people that have been in the industry uh we prefer users uh, because then they can really click with the patient because they've actually consumed it themselves they get an mm -hmm. idea of how that makes them feel mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Beyond that, I would say our bud tenders being warm, friendly, uh, <clears throat> recommending things, but not pushing them. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, typically, like, let's say someone is coming in for a certain flower and, you know, they like these terpenes. What typically our bud tenders will do is actually see what they purchased last time, you mm -hmm. know, and give them recommendations based on what they purchased last time, if they liked it or if they didn't like it. And so they really make them feel like, like we know you and you're supporting us and we're supporting you. Yeah. And uh, I think that that's one of the biggest things in the dispensary is really developing that relationship with the patient. Uh, and to do that, you, 
Number one, you can't have high turnover of bud tenders. You have right. to treat them, treat your bud tenders uh, good, actually great enough to stay on board with you. But you also still have to stay within your budget of yeah. being open uh, in this market. And so um, I would say, yeah, a lot of it is, of course, the quality and everything. But the in store, uh, that comes down to having team meetings with the bud tenders, talking mm -hmm. about our patients, talking about what they're wanting, what they're liking, what they've requested, um, as well as just kind of uh, intermingling the bud tenders with each other because the patients come in at different times. And mm -hmm. when the bud tenders get together in meetings, they can kind of relay that information to the other bud tenders about the patients. And... Uh, yeah, I would really say most of that has to do with with uh, you know just communication between bud tenders, communication between the bud tender and the patient, and uh, and making sure that they're happy. I mean, customer satisfaction is is key, absolutely. Yeah. And so, yeah. whatever we have to do to make that happen, we try our best to do, um, and and we do really. Uh, try to give back to the patients and we you know like there's there's one thing in our store and i've never really talked about this in public but mm -hmm. the products that we bring on i won't accept a product if it's remediated so that that's the level of of interest that we have in our patients themselves is that we're not even willing to take in a product that has failed testing for mm. microbials, mildews, molds, uh, heavy metals, whatever it was. And then it's right. been remediated through extraction purposes, which don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm experienced in extracting and you can clean that stuff up, but I want a quality source. Right. Um, and, right. and, and whatever I have to do to get that, is is what i'll do and and i've had to explain that to patients and had our bud tenders explain it to patients yeah. you know, why why don't you guys carry this cart or why don't you guys carry this yeah. well the fact of the matter is that that product has actually been remediated and it's failed testing before and we're not really willing to risk your health on that so right uh, that's kind of one of the things that i try to try to push so that's interesting so would you say this uh, level, level of, I guess, like quality, quality, um, assurance is like a hunter level personal thing. Um, and that it's so high that you even have to educate the customers onto this thing. Like they're not even looking at it right now. It's like, it's specifically you because you know that that product's better. Yeah, it, it does have something to do with me, but it also yeah. has a lot to do with, with our bud tenders and the patients and what, right. the, what feedback they give us. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah it's it's kind of a mix yeah, yeah yeah i mean you strike me as a guy that has really high standards for the the product the quality of your product right i mean you've mentioned it a bunch of times and that's how you can kind of tell what that person finds important almost by the frequency at which they repeat said subject right and not just in cannabis just in life in general right mm -hmm. um and I, I think it's really really awesome that like you know, uh, you going through the process, the extra steps, the extra costs, the extra hassle, like, you know, you see a product, your customers want it, but you're going to say no. So you're essentially giving up money, right? Um, because you don't have that product, because customers are literally saying, if you have it, I will buy it, right? That's like, that's like the best relationship that you want with your customers saying, hey, if you have it, I'll just I'll buy it from you, right? Yeah. Um, so I find that very, very interesting. And I, you know, I, I wouldn't say I've spoken to every single dispensary owner, but you kind of alluded to it before to where there are a lot of dispensaries that are not necessarily in the best position to be turning away money, right? Yeah. Like if, if you're walking in into a lot of these stores and you from a cultivation standpoint, a dispensary standpoint, you, your sample size of what you see being a good dispensary and being a quote unquote bad dispensary, not to any fault of the dispensary owner themselves directly. Although you can talk about entrepreneurship and, you know, accountability, blah, blah, blah. But, mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that like, this is a really high standard, uh, that you have for yourself because this is something that is really important to you. Whereas other kind of dispensary owners just might not be in a position to be able to do it, or, you know, they just might need to do it to keep their business open. Right. So, 
I think that's something you should put all over your website, actually. I know you said you haven't mentioned it in person, but like something like that is especially on the medical side of things. Like this isn't just your classic recreational 25 year old that's living near a college town. That's like, how can I get the cheapest thing? It's a medical patient that's looking to feel a specific way based on consuming a specific product. And if you can give them the cleanest thing based on your, uh, you know, quality uh, measures, then I think that's a really, really good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, w- I would say a lot of that is, is really based on the fact that this business is designed for longevity. Mm. And, and I think um, by doing the patients right, it it will make it, you know, yeah. and, and maybe it's, it's to detriment right now because yeah. it doesn't necessarily fill my pocket. Uh, but I think over time people, and, and I would say that they are realizing like that dispensary is a great dispensary and they always sell good products and they, they, they don't really recommend anything bad because they don't really have anything bad, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I would say uh unfortunately i probably don't cater to some of the people that that want that product but uh but that's just kind of how i I designed the the dispensary to be and i i I look up to a lot of dispensaries you know like i said i'm from colorado so i spent plenty of time i actually watched a lot of dispensaries pop up there in the early days and Mm -hmm. i watched a a lot of them grow like the the green solution and some other big companies that always did things like that Mm -hmm. and they Mm -hmm. they just said like we're going to be this quality of a of a store and it should last and now right. they've got whatever 21 stores or however yeah. many you know and it and it's been a proven model right. and that's kind of where i where i came up with the idea of doing the dispensary that and catering to uh, high quality products and, and high quality customers for sure definitely long-term thinking over short-term thinking anyways Yeah, for sure. But before we continue, if you're enjoying this episode and are looking for some marketing help for your own dispensary, you can check us out at cannabudmarketing.com or visit us in the links in the description below. Now, on to the rest of the episode. So uh, an important part to quality products is also vendor relationships. You know, how do you source good quality products? Who do you source them from? So on and so forth. So what is, you know, how do you go about managing your own vendor relationships? Um you have like a three strikes policy like sort of thing where you know if you know vendors are not giving you product up to the standards that you want you're going to take them off the shelf no matter you know how they're selling inside the store like you know what is your process surrounding that whole aspect of the business communication is key there i think uh especially with with the vendors uh, they start to understand what you're looking for why you're looking for it and and what you expect consistently right Uh, i would say that um unfortunately there's times where you have to communicate bad news to the vendor and and uh i think you would do a disservice to yourself if you didn't do that right Um, i would say you know we we try to always meet them in the middle you know we we're not always trying to bring them down on price. We're not always trying to make them deliver for free. We'll, we try to play fair with them. Sure, and, of course. Um, I think we typically take our feedback from our patients and our bug mm. tenders, and we transfer that over to, the, to our vendors. And our vendors will transfer it back to us, you know. Um, and so uh, if, if something is not quite right, or, or there's any level of dissatisfaction anywhere, mm-hmm. uh, I think that communication is key there. And it, it, that's a good way to develop uh, well, really any relationship, but uh, our relationship with our vendors, uh, that's the main thing is just communicating the fact of what we want, why we want it, when we need it, and, uh, and what we expect out of them. And they communicate what they expect out of us. So, right. Do you have a specific example? Maybe something that happened recently that, you know, a uh, patient said this, communicated it to the vendor, vendor came back and said X? Yeah. So I would say 
a recent example of, of vendor problems. Uh, one of the one of the problems that we run into is when we order product, sometimes their consistency as far as production goes mm. isn't quite there. So we may be on hold while our patients like they they want what they want when they yep. want it. Yep. You know, and uh, if we don't keep enough stock in our store to cover that uh, that downtime of theirs, then it creates a moment for them to conveniently go and get it from another dispensary that has sure. the stock. Uh, sure. Weed Maps is the name of the game because it's convenient and a lot of patients can find out where that product is when they want it right away. Right. You know, go there and, and that gives the, you a chance at losing a customer and so i would just say that uh, yeah in in that case specifically we just kind of told them like hey we need when we put an order in we need it delivered within 24 hours if we have to we'll send our delivery driver to go and get it yeah, whatever yeah. it takes to make sure that our patients don't run out of their medicine you know? right and so um that's one small example. Amongst right, all. right. When you make those moves, is it like when one patient says that they need the product and you don't have it, you're like, we got to get this product in? Is it like if five patients say it, do you have like a threshold or is it just like a gut feeling? You're like, oh, crap, like we don't have this in. We need to get more product in. Typically, we put orders in based on a threshold. So yeah. uh, in our point of sale system, it notifies us when we get below a certain quantity of product. Right. And from that point, we'll go ahead and put the order in. Um, and if the vendor doesn't have it, we understand it. We'll relate that to the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also been times where we have actually worked with other dispensaries to curate product because mm -hmm. we need it so bad. And you can buy dispensary to dispensary. And uh, in order to, to take care of your patients, that's key. So. Right. We have we have some patients in particular that really prefer a, a lemonade made by the company Smokies Edibles, and uh, and they come regularly for it. But they had a downtime there where uh, we weren't able to provide that product, and what we did was we we ourselves pulled up weed maps, looked for the dispensary near us that we could actually support because we want to support the community too and actually reach out to them and say, Hey, we have a patient that really wants this product. We're curious if we can buy some off of you and we'll leave a little bit of profit margin there and we'll lose some, you know, so right. that way it works for both of us. Right. Right. Yeah. That's um, so I had another interview recently. It hasn't come out as yet, but we were talking about the collaboration in the dispensary space and he was a bar owner and you know, the way the, you know, his, that the, his colleagues and his peers worked was that, you know, open up the bar. And then at the end of the night, you know, they would, all the bar owners would go grab a drink at the end of the night and kind of get together and, you know, you know, have a good time together where he now is a dispensary owner. Um, it's out in Portland. Um, and he was saying it's a lot more secretive where people are like withholding secrets and they're trying to like, you know, um, every man for themselves kind of mentality. Right. <laughs> Do you find it the same in Oklahoma? But, you know, I know you just had a story right there that really worked out. But, like, is that the norm or is that, like, kind of, you know, the outlier? I would say that it's a bit of an outlier. So we yeah. kind of okay. have to search out that situation. And, uh, you know, fortunately, because we have a cultivation, we have developed mm -hmm. relationships with a lot of other dispensaries and right. processors as well. Like, we right. – we, uh, you have to be creative in this market and there's times when we'll even trade product out of our cultivation to a processor they'll yeah. uh, do whatever they do with it make it into pre-rolls uh, edibles whatever and then they'll credit our dispensary to where to where we're really just developing relationships everywhere that we can but yeah. i would say very much so in the cannabis space that it's it's way more competitive and secretive than yeah. something like like craft brewing everybody is really happy to share their info and, and yeah. there's enough flavors to go around and, uh, and, and there's something for everybody and people are pretty collaborative whereas 
uh, in the cannabis industry as a whole on both sides, cultivation mm -hmm. and dispensary, it is a bit more secretive and it is a bit more competitive. Right, right. Yeah, because he was saying that, you know, it would make sense, you know, because, you know, pretty much everyone's vertically integrated and everyone's growing relative, you know, going back to the brand versus commodity types of products, right? Everyone's growing relatively the same types of product, right? And it would make sense that, you know, uh, you know, dispensary A focuses on this, dispensary B focuses on this, uh, you get your products at cost and essentially you do a barter. So it's cheaper on the, um, the growing cultivation processing side. And then you can also sell at a better profit margin because you're essentially just like bartering products back and forth. So yeah. I thought that was super interesting. You know, the whole uh, uh, rising tide lifts all ships um, yeah. mantra and stuff like that. I feel like that would make a lot of sense. Like, you know, do you think that collaboration in the industry would be more helpful or are you the you know i'm going to crush the rest of my competition you know that's personally it. i i think that collaboration would be very helpful uh, right. any time that i've collaborated not any time most, most. of the time I've collaborated <laughs> with, uh, with others it, yeah. it works out well you know yeah. and it works out well for both for both parts yeah you know, we're we're integrated and there's others that are integrated as well that we work with where if their dispensary especially is on another part of town or yeah. another part of the state yeah. we'll actually basically trade flavors out of our cultivation with them like makes sense hey, look you give us four of your strains four pounds of your strains and we'll give you four of ours and they're both good quality product. We can do an even trade on that. And then we can offer our patients those new flavors directly without really without even exchanging any money. You yeah. Know? yeah. So uh, collaboration works very well. It works mm -hmm. very well in the brewing industry and in the alcohol industry. It works very well in most anything, but, um, but, it's not very common in the cannabis industry. Right, right. Yeah, it seems unfortunate because it already seems like it's like a us versus a world mentality where it's just like you're dealing with compliance, regulation, you know, people, you know, just trying to take advantage of you. Then you have the customers and you have the stigma. And then at the same time, it's like there's like an, an internal divide within each of the people inside. And it's like, well, you know, at the end of the day, if you want the industry as a whole to kind of be better and you want to provide a better product to your customers and you want to have a margin doing it because at the end of the day nobody runs a business to to break even right everyone wants to run a profit you know you don't work a job just for fun even though you say this is you know this is the best thing ever you're not going to do it for free right yeah. so you know uh the, the collaboration to me it, it makes a lot of sense and especially even if you're not direct competitors like i'm not going to drive 50 miles just because you know you know hunter i really like you but i don't know if i'm going to drive 50 miles just <laughs> when i have somebody down the street especially if i can kind of get the same product um and you know it's mutually beneficial for everyone so yeah um it's interesting because i would be talking to different dispensary owners about collaboration everyone's like yeah like it makes a lot of sense and then when it really comes down to it it's like oh no everyone's super secretive and it you know to, to me it's a very interesting kind of like a little paradox that's going on right now yeah it is i think that it just kind of has to do with the infancy of the market and the competitiveness yeah. as yeah. is you know yeah. i think that uh if if you were to look back in history, I would say that alcohol producers were probably pretty secretive. I'm at sure. One time, but now that market is so leveled out, and and you know everybody has realized that there's enough to go around and, and a spot at the table for everybody. Yeah, um, and that has a craft that it can work. For sure, for sure. So on the relationship kind of topic, um, I think the the last piece of the puzzle and you spoke about this before about how you know the bud tenders your staff they they are the team right they are the people front facing they're interacting with your customers they directly influence if people are going to come back or not right aside yeah. from the product so what is your kind of process just to make sure that your you know your employees are doing what they should be doing because you know i've heard stories of people kind of skimming products off the top um, people just not showing up to work and stuff like that. And I'm sure you've had your fair share of that. Um, but, you know, what's your process to at least, you know, reduce that as best as possible? I would say that oversight is key. Mm. Uh, so um, there are times when 
uh, myself and my wife get spread a little bit thin. Mm -hmm. She runs our dispensary and I run uh, the cultivation side as well as the whole company as a whole. Yeah. And uh, when you get spread thin, things can happen. Right. Uh, and you, you don't quite have the oversight that you need to have. And it's not just looking over their shoulder. It's actually working hand in hand with them. Like and as a team. Yeah, and, and, and staying a team. And mm. if you do that and you communicate, then the things typically work pretty smooth. We've had uh, we've had a few bad apples uh, that had really smooth uh, strategies and stuff to, to take themselves home a little extra off the top. But um, if, if you have oversight, and mm -hmm. in those situations, it was, it was simply because we weren't, we weren't there enough. Sure, and, sure. And we learned the hard way that that's something that you really have to do or you really have to have your manager do and then you have to have the oversight of your manager. So right. uh, I would say that that's, that's one of the main keys to success and, and keeping your team on board with you, uh, keeping them feeling like they're a team. We also do things like team building events, like an escape room. Uh, sure. Get everybody in an escape room. You make them work together, and uh, and it works out well for developing relationships between the bud tenders, the manager, the owners, and everything. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I mean, you know, the whole entropy, how everything kind of you know goes towards chaos, and everything kind of breaks apart. And you know, as as the business owner. At the end of the day, the bud tenders are not the owners of the store, right? They don't have, it's not necessarily the ownership mentality, nor should it necessarily be, right? Um, but having oversight, kind of what you said, and just kind of keeping an eye on how things are going, you then, as we spoke about that, that level of standard, it's, you know, it's, it's a couple percentage points higher because you expect different out of your own baby, out of your own business um, mm -hmm. that you want to keep together versus like a bud tender or something like that. Um, and yeah, I find that interesting when people are spread thin or sometimes even when things are going really well, you're like, ah, you know, things are rocking and rolling. This is relatively passive. You take, you know, you have like five days off. You're like, oh, I've worked so hard. The business is finally smooth. You just like chill for a second, then get a call Saturday morning that something went wrong, right? Like, yeah. again, it's, it's, it's always the case. <laughs> so uh, where do you I, see? Yeah, go ahead. I think one of the, one of the other things there to, uh, to also build your relationship and your team is just really being fair with them. Of course. I, I know everything is about margins and everything is about profit, but that's one thing that we've kind of put to the side to to develop the right team that we want. And, fair. and you have to understand that, you know, but tender A is – maybe not able to focus on their work or give back to the patients because they're, they can't pay their bills at home or yeah. something, you know? So you really have to, uh, I think anyway, you have to treat them like your family and yeah. you have to take care of them and be fair with them uh, within your means, of course. Of course. But, uh, but I think that that's super important. Right. 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 I mean, context is everything, right? There's that, there's that story, I don't know, real or not, you know, if somebody steals from a fruit stall, are they a criminal or not? Criminal or not? Yes or no. Are they stealing to provide for their family because they don't have any money to? Yes, no, right? It's just morals and ethics, right? And, and I think on a much less extreme level, day to day, I, I think we all get caught up in our own kind of issues, you know, blah, blah, blah. I stubbed my toe this morning. Every time I put on my shoe, uh, I can't put it on probably because it hurts, right? So then that's just kind of affecting your day. Um, but then somebody sees you being like in a bad mood. You're like, well, I just stubbed my toe this morning. Just, you know, hop off a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, so again, like you said, that kind of balance of like, you know, uh, treating your bud tenders like your family and being able to ensure that they are in an environment where they feel comfortable, but not too comfortable, where they got their feet up on the desk kind of thing, right? That fine, that fine line of things, right? Um, yeah. So where do you see the future of the cannabis industry heading in a, in a, in a couple of years? Uh, hopefully, hopefully it just kind of levels off. I really sure. don't see it uh, becoming that great or that big of a profitable industry it used to be pretty profitable 
and uh, lucrative to some. But I really feel like it's just becoming more streamlined and more mainstream. Mm. People are using a, a, a rapid rate, and it's becoming more normal. Uh, the cannabis industry, I think, will hopefully get a little bit of respect from the from the feds. Uh, we'll see how descheduling it goes, and uh, you you really never know. I, I I'd hate to count my chickens before they're hatched, you know. So, uh, but I, I really don't see it becoming less saturated. Sure. You know, sure. More and more people are are looking to get into the business. More states are coming on board. Yeah. Um, I would say that our biggest competition right now is is the black market. Right. And and by over regulating and putting in Oklahoma at least when you put business owners in a situation where they have to choose between either feeding their family or staying compliant they're yep. going to feed their family and yep. what that does is it makes the black market grow and that takes away from the legal market and right. um, as well as other things uh, that kind of mix up that balance right. but i think as regulation becomes steady mm -hmm. which is something we don't have here in oklahoma because every three months or six months the laws are changing at a rapid pace um, but when they become steady and you know a lot of the fly-by-night people start to fall out or get busted or whatever yeah. they're doing uh they move on to the next state i think that it'll it'll become pretty steady and stable uh, but I, I don't see it getting uh, more lucrative per se or, right. or I, I really don't see it getting much worse i think that last year was was probably the worst year on, on record for the cannabis industry and uh, a lot of that had to do with oklahoma and the overproduction that it it uh, it had sure uh, because a lot of that fed into the black market i think and yeah. uh when when your neighbor has product for you for half the price, uh, you don't even have to move. And, and yeah. You don't have to go to a store. You don't have to have a medical license. You don't have to do anything. You just get it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That that hurts dispensaries. It hurts the government. It hurts hurts legal business all all around. Uh, yeah. So I think that I think that it'll it'll just slowly and steadily become more mainstream. And, uh, and stable, but I don't really see it necessarily going up or, or down. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that it's in a decent spot right now. It's it's not crazy lucrative or anything like that, but it's it's a good business to be in. And, uh, and more than anything, we're a part of a really good community. And uh, so I think it really depends on what your goals are in this industry, you know. Right. So. Uh, at, at one time, I had this big picture of getting rich, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I threw that out the window uh, because I realized that 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 wouldn't be what made me happy anyway. So, right, right, uh, right. I think I think as people start to realize who the people are that are supporting patients and supporting their customers just as they support them, yeah, uh, then those guys will start to stand out in business overall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, well, you know, it, it's again, it's a lot of the the infancy of the industry, right? You know, the the gold rush, if you will, may have gone, but I do think there are a few more steps. You know, the first one is the recreational legalization as well, right? Uh, I was working with a client like out in Montana. They went from medical to recreational, and boom, there's like another kind of mini rush, right? Yeah. Um, and I think eventually, you know, it is to some level a game of attrition. Who is going to be there when? things are actually good um you know because people aren't necessarily buying you know street level moonshine well maybe some people are but like you know most people are going into the stores to buy their alcohol right so um at, at some point in time hopefully we'll get to a place where you know for the people that who are standing and for the new dispensaries who learn from you know again people like yourself like the pioneers in this space if you will like the ones that are here at the beginning 
I think it'll be really, really interesting in the future to, you know, kind of get those things up and running and just, you know, kind of see where the industry lands. Um, sure. So what's next in store for you? Uh, next in store for us is probably another dispensary. Nice. Uh, so I, I would like to, one of my ideas behind the dispensary was to get patients our product at a more affordable cost because, um, because that's who I'm here for is the patient. Patients. That's what got me involved in this industry was, was helping out uh, one of Colorado's first patients. Uh, and that's, that's how I started growing. Yep. And, uh, and it just has, has steadily evolved into really supporting the whole community of patients mm. and, and users as a whole. And, um, so I would like to, to do another dispensary and, uh, and start to get our product to them at a little bit more affordable cost and also show patients in other parts of town that that you can, you can have a real professional business and you can have a real clean cut professional dispensary that makes you feel good when you walk in and right. when you leave there you feel good and you're happy to leave a five star review and you're happy to come back you know and it becomes one of those things that patients and users as a whole start to actually look forward to is supporting their local dispensary. And uh, that that's kind of our goal with our dispensary. And, and it's going to be the goal with the new one as well. Uh, it's just going to be in a little bit different community and, right. uh, and probably a little bit different SOPs and, and uh, take some of the things that we've learned and put them into service. For sure. So what would you say to a dispensary owner who's looking to take it to the next level? I would say one thing that I've learned having a dispensary is that you're a bit of a convenience store. Mm. Uh, there's dispensaries are, are everywhere. And uh, if you're wanting to be the king of, of dispensaries, then you need to be the king of convenience. And you have to have everything that the customer wants in nice. the right place uh easily accessible affordable um i i would i would say that it's somewhat like some of the big gas stations uh there's there's certain gas stations out there like in the states especially around oklahoma there's a couple truck stops that really dominate uh, loves and and uh, a couple others on queue, but those places, if you look at them, they they offer every bit of convenience. They have a drive-through. They have toilet paper. They have or they have whatever you could want, really. At least something of that category that you could want or need, and it's convenient. And I think that uh, other dispensary owners, I would say. Offer that to your to your customers. Offer that to your patients, and um, do your patients right. Like don't don't just be there to make a dollar on them. Be there to actually help them. Uh, be there to actually get them what they want at an affordable rate, and and don't be greedy. And I think that, uh, that over time you'll start to see that it'll it'll pay off. Right, right, right. Find the affordable toilet paper version for your own dispensary and give it to your customers as best as possible. Yeah, something like that. Sure. <laughs> awesome. Hunter, thank you very much for hopping on the show. Um, how can people find you if they want to get in touch? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, if they want to get in touch, you can always find us on our website, uh, www.fullpowerok.com. Uh, we are also on the social channels. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Full Power OKC, or Full Power Oklahoma. Uh, you can find us there. Um, and we'll probably start to do a little bit of podcasting ourselves and Ooh, possibly nice. a YouTube channel. And uh, like I've spoke with you before about maybe uh, ramping up our web website and making it easier to communicate with people trying to reach out to us there. So. Nice, nice. Well, you guys heard it here first. If you're out in the Edmond, Oklahoma area, go visit Full Power because Hunter has the best products available. Um, he just went on about how good the quality products are. And 
that is not very common. So uh, again, thank you very much for hopping on the show. Um, until next time, I'll see you guys later. Bye. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. My name is Brandon Kwan, and I'm the founder of Cannabud Marketing, the number one marketing agency of choice for dispensaries, both in the United States and in Canada. If you ever want to get in touch with me about any marketing strategies, tips, and tricks, I can definitely help you. Just go visit our website at cannabudmarketing.com. That's C A N N A B U D marketing.com, or just check the links in the description below. Until next time, talk to you later. Bye. Thank you.